Assalamu alaikum dear students. How are we today? I hope you found my first lecture in introductory economics useful. Although I tried to keep that lecture as simple as possible in presentation, I still recall from my student years how hard it sometimes is to grasp any new concept, indeed a new subject. Often what happens is that the instructor answers one question and in the process plants two more unanswered questions in your mind. And you begin to wonder whether you are better off or worse off than before. So if this is beginning to happen uh, with you, don't worry or panic. This is the natural process of learning. In fact, I would start worrying if all of you turned around to me and said, Yes, Mr. Abbas, we understand everything perfectly. No, that is not the statement of a scholar or a scholar to be. In fact, as you rise further and further up the knowledge ladder, you'll realize how little you know. This is the classic dilemma of scholarship. Now, given that philosophical view of things in the back of our minds, let's recap on what little we do know about economics. We know that at the heart of economics is the problem of scarcity. Human wants are unlimited, but the goods and services that can be produced to satisfy those wants are limited. And we know why they are limited, right? They are limited because the underlying factors of production, yes, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship are limited. Another way of saying that human wants are unlimited and the supply of goods and services is limited is to say that potential demand by households is unlimited or exceeds the potential supply by firms, the potential supply of goods and services. So we need to find a way to ensure that actual demand equals actual supply. And to ensure this, you naturally need a system of rationing. Now there are three dimensions to this decision uh, to ration. We must decide what to produce, how to produce, and for whom, for whom to produce. Now, taking our example of the previous lecture, the decision on what to produce involves determining the number of cars or bicycles that we want to produce. Remember that in our previous lecture, we assumed that the economy produces only two goods, Rolls Royces, which are an example of cars, and bicycles. And we need to decide how many Rolls Royces to produce or cars to produce and how many bicycles to produce. Now let's assume that we want to produce 1,000 cars and 1 million bicycles. So that's the answer to the first question. We'll get to how we actually decide on this number in subsequent lectures. But let's assume that for the sake of moving on. Once you've determine the number, you need to then decide how to produce those 1,000 cars and 1 million bicycles. So for example, should you devote all your labor force to the production of bicycles and all your capital to the production of cycles, to the cars? That's one way to produce it, right? Or should you, should you have it the other way? Should you devote all your capital to the production of cars and all your labor force to the production of bicycles? Or there could be a mix of the two. So some capital and a lot of labor to the production of cars and some labor and a lot of capital to the production of bicycles. So there are a number of ways in which you could produce the same 1,000 bicycles and the same 1, 000, 1 million, oh, sorry, 1,000 cars and 1 million bicycles. Now once you've decided how to produce those cars and bicycles, you then need to decide who will consume those bicycles and cars. Now in the previous lecture, we saw that there were three approaches that could be employed, or three approaches or systems that could be employed to answer these three fundamental questions induced by scarcity. We saw that there was the possibility of having a dictatorship in which only a few people decided the fate of the entire population. Then there was the option of having a command or planned economy in which we had the central government as the central planner who planned for the entire economy. And finally, we saw that there was the free market or capitalist economy in which the price mechanism was used as the rationing device. 
Now, after weighing the pros and cons of each of these three systems, we had observed that over the, over the last few years, the, the preference for the price mechanism, the preference for the free market economy has increased and become more wide-ranging in our world. And the reason for that was mainly that the price mechanism works very fast. It is very efficient. So at any time, the optimal mix of goods and services is more likely to obtain than it is likely to obtain under dictatorship or the planned economy. Now, another aspect of the free market system, which we did not touch upon in, in detail in the last lecture, but which is central to the discussion of today's lecture, is that it allows, the free market system allows individuals the freedom to make independent choices. There is no single dictator, there is no group of select bureaucrats or government officials deciding the fate of the entire population or the entire economy. It is the individuals themselves who decide what to consume and at what price, what to produce and at what price, and what to offer in terms of their economic resources, land, labor, and capital, and at what price. And then by coming together in the markets for goods, services, and factors, these individuals decide as to what the equilibrium price and quantity will obtain in those factor, service, and goods markets. This is how the price mechanism works through the exercise of independent choices by individuals. Now, given that discussion, we can now present the free market system as one which addresses the problem of scarcity by using the price rationing system as the rationing device, the price mechanism as the rationing device, and allowing individuals to make free and independent choices. But this creates a more fundamental problem, which is that how do individuals make these choices? How do individuals decide what to consume, what to produce, and how to allocate their resources at the individual level? More importantly, how do they choose between different options? How do they decide which choice is the most optimal one, or the best one, or the most rational, as we say, in economics? Now, a simple answer to this question, which hopefully would crop up in your mind as well, could be that individuals would simply look at, first of all, the costs and benefits of all these different decisions, and then choose the decision which maximizes the benefit relative to the cost. I'll repeat it again. They'll compare the costs and benefits of all these different decisions, and then choose the decision which maximizes the benefit relative to the cost. Hmm, surprise, surprise. That's my answer as well. Rational choices are simply a result of a cost-benefit analysis at the individual level. Now, let's look at a few examples to illustrate this. Let's go to a few slides. Now, in this example, we have an individual who, for example, lives in Lahore and who is offered a job or who is offered two jobs. He has two jobs before him and he has to decide which job to choose. One job is in Lahore, where he lives himself, and the other one is in Gujranwala, which is at a little distance away. And he has to commute daily to Gujranwala and then come back. So he's not living in Gujranwala. Now, how does he decide between these two job offers? As you can see, the Lahore job offers him a salary, which would be the benefit in this case, of rupees 15,000 per month. Whereas the Gujranwala job offers him a slightly higher salary, so that the benefit is higher, and he's paid 20,000 per month. Now, at the surface of it, you might think that the Gujranwala job is better, and so he should choose that particular job. But then we need to look at the cost column as well, as to what are the additional costs of working in Gujranwala relative to working in Lahore. Now, one obvious cost would be transportation. If you're living in Lahore and you're working in Lahore, then your transportation costs are naturally going to be lower. Whereas if you're working in Gujranwala and commuting daily to and fro from, from Lahore, then naturally that will cost more. I've put down some estimates, rough estimates, of what these costs could be. So if you work in Lahore, your transportation costs would be 1,000 per month. 
rupees 1000 whereas if you work in gujranwala your transportation costs are roughly 7000 rupees per month now as you can see the introduction of costs transforms the nature of the problem because not only do we have benefits now to base our decision on we also have costs and therefore we must get an idea of what the net benefit or net salary is which we will derive from these two job offers before we can decide which one to pick. So let's look at the final column on the right which gives net benefit. Now as you can see the net benefit for job A would be the 15,000 salary minus the 1,000 transportation cost which is 14,000 rupees in this case. Whereas the net benefit or salary derived from working in Gujranwala would be the rupees 20,000 salary minus the 7,000 transportation cost, which gives 13,000. So a rational decision maker will choose job A, which offers a higher net benefit, even though the gross benefit, which was 15,000, was less than the gross benefit being offered for job B. This is a simple example of how rational choices would be made when you have different benefits and different costs in front of you. Now in this new slide, we have an example where a person is faced again uh, with two job offers. But this time both the offers are in Lahore and in fact in the proximity of his house. So let's say this person is an accountant and he can work as an accountant in a bank or he can work as an accountant in a factory and both the bank and factory are located very near to his house so that there are no transportation costs. Now let's look at the first column which is of benefit. The benefit or salary derived from the job in bank is 15,000 per month, whereas the benefit or salary derived from working as an accountant in the factory is 16,000 rupees per month. Now, a decision based simply on gross benefit would probably warrant that he work in the factory, not in the bank. But let's now add the cost dimension to this particular problem. Now, unlike the previous problem where you had transportation costs which, which are tangible and quantifiable in rupee terms, we have, let's say in this particular example, environmental costs. So that the working uh, environment in the bank is better, noiseless, quiet, peaceful, whereas the working environment in the factory is noisy and it's not clean and all of that. So in this particular case, we have an example where the cost is not immediately quantifiable. Right? And this is where subjectivity in decision making comes in. One person might value the noise in the factory as, as very high. So he might want to discount heavily for that. He might say the noise in the factory is worth 4,000 rupees for me. So he, he would deduct 4,000 from his gross benefit to arrive at 12,000 as his net benefit. Another person might say that I don't, re don't really care about uh, noise. I'm willing to work and uh, I'll just put a zero there in front of, in front of uh, the second job in the cost column. And therefore in that case he will choose to work in the factory. I've taken a hypothetical example in which the person or one person assigns zero, which would be the natural thing to do, uh, and the cost column for, for bank and 2,000 rupees as the cost column in the cost column for, for factory. And this gives him a net benefit of 15,000 for working in the bank and a net benefit of 14,000 for working in the factory. Now, rational choices demand this person to choose job A, which is working in the bank, because it offers the higher net benefit. Let me put forward a question for you now, something to think about. Is it possible for a consumer to choose job B and still be rational? Now, a clue to the answer to this question is, is, what, is in what I already said. Yes, it is possible because the costs in this case are not quantifiable immediately. They are a result of subjective valuation by the individuals. So one person values the cost of noise of working in factory B as 2000. It is entirely possible for another person to value it at zero, as I mentioned before. Also, it is possible that a person might value the cost of working in the factory at 2000 and still prefer to work in the factory. Why would this be possible and why would this be rational? This would be rational because the cost of noise is not a cash cost. 
So it is not something that you pay out uh, physically as you paid out in the case of transportation cost. And you can think of an example in which a person who wants to save up some money to either buy a house or buy a car and who might be willing to, in the short run, tolerate the higher noise of working in the factory, but who would really appreciate earning that extra 1,000 rupees per month, which would help him save money for his car or house. So that would still be a rational decision. The decision of whether a person decides to work in the factory or the bank in this particular case depends on what that 1,000 additional benefit that he derives from working in the factory can be used for. If it can be used for something which is really productive, then he would like to work in the factory and ignore the cost of noise that he incurs by working there. But if that extra 1,000 does not mean a lot to him, then he might decide to work in the bank. Now, the most important thing to note about the two examples that I've just given you is that the comparison of costs and benefits is a very subjective matter. The net benefit derived from engaging in any activity is likely to be different for different individuals. Now, keeping that principle in mind, we can move to how firms decide about their production decisions. So, let's say we have a firm which is thinking about opening a new production line for cars. So, it's a car manufacturing firm. A rational decision will again involve weighing the costs and benefits of opening the new production line. So, what are the costs in this case? The costs would be the additional labor that will have to be employed, the additional raw material that has to be procured, the additional parts and components that have to be bought. And what are the uh, benefits? The benefits are the additional revenues that will be earned by selling the additional number of cars. It will only be profitable or rational to open the new production line if the revenues that are expected to be generated from the sale of the new cars are higher than the additional costs that will be incurred in their production. Now, having looked at how rational choices depend on weighing benefits and costs of a particular decision, let's now focus a little bit more on costs and what they mean in economics. Now, since all modern costs in today's world are denominated in money or monetary terms, economists have spent a lot of time puzzling over what could be categorized as truly economic costs. As you remember, I told you in the last lecture that economics was not about money, was not all about money, especially paper money. And I gave you the example of a lottery, that if you won a lottery and had, and had a lot of money with you, that would not solve your economic problem. I also gave the example, if you remember, of a barter economy in which there is no money and exchange happens through the exchange of goods and services. And so economists are interested in locating costs which would be incurred in these situations as well. That is, costs which are independent of denomination in terms of paper money. Let's see what economists came up with. The idea put forth was that of opportunity cost. That is, the cost of any activity measured in terms of the best alternative foregone or given up. So, for example, the opportunity cost of buying something is what else you could have done with that money. Let's illustrate this by an example and let's refer to our slide for this. Now, consider the decision to buy a book costing rupees 200. The opportunity cost of this purchase is the next best use of the rupees 200. Now, this will vary from person to person. For some, it might be buying new clothes worth, worth rupees 200. For others, it might be going out for dinner and spending 200 there. For yet others, it might be giving charity worth rupees 200. Now, whether the person buys the book or not depends on the benefits of these various other possibilities. You will only buy the book if the benefit accruing from all other activities is less than the benefit accruing from buying the book. So you need some kind of a scale for benefit to complete this analysis. Now let's say the benefit from buying a book worth rupees 200 is 10 satisfaction units. The benefit from buying clothes worth rupees 200 is 5 satisfaction units, while the benefit from giving charity worth rupees 200 is 20 satisfaction units. In this case, 
Would you buy the book? No. Now let's change the numbers a little bit. Assume that the benefit from buying the book is still 10 satisfaction units, but that the benefit from buying clothes is 5 satisfaction units, and the benefit from buying or giving charity is 8 satisfaction units. Would you now buy the book? Yes. Because the benefit from all other alternatives is less than that derived from buying the book. Given this, what is the opportunity cost of buying the book? The opportunity cost is 8 satisfaction units. That is the benefit you would have derived from giving charity, which was the next most profitable or beneficial use of the rupees 200. Note that the opportunity cost is not denominated in money terms. It is denominated in terms of satisfaction units. Thus, this can serve as an example of an economic cost which is not denominated in money or not dependent on paper denomination. Also note that opportunity cost in this case is not the five satisfaction units that would be derived from purchasing new clothes because that is lower than the benefit derived from giving charity and hence does not constitute the most profitable use foregone. Repeating this principle once again, the opportunity cost of an activity, in this case buying a book, is measured in terms of the benefit of the best alternative given up, which in this case is giving charity. To develop our understanding a little bit better, let us extend the above example to the case when you are faced with the decision to sell the book that you just bought. How would you go about making a rational decision in this case? Let's illustrate through another slide. Now, as you can see, there will be four distinct steps in this decision. In the first instance, you will assess the benefits to you of continuing to use the book. Next, you will find the best second-hand price you can obtain for the book, right? In a second-hand market or a second-hand bookstore or something. Thirdly, you will assess the benefits of the next best use of this money that you will get from selling the book in a second-hand market. So this would be the opportunity cost. Four, if the benefit of the next best use of the money that you will get as a result of selling the book is greater than the benefit of continued use of the book, then the decision to sell the book is rational. Otherwise, the rational decision is to keep the book. An important point about the, about the above decision-making process is that the Initial cost incurred in purchasing the book, which is the rupees 200 paid for initially buying the book, does not feature anywhere in the decision to sell the book. So, in other words, the history of the book, how it was bought, when it was bought, and at what price it was bought, becomes irrelevant for the decision to sell the book again in a second-hand market. Now, some of you might be wondering, how could this possibly be rational? Well, for economists, it is rational. And for this, we need to introduce the concept of marginal versus total analysis. The main proposition here is that rational choices involve weighing or comparing marginal costs versus marginal benefits, not total costs versus total benefits. Let's illustrate this using a simple example. Now, in this case, we have a firm which is a car producing firm which has produced 10 cars so far. The total cost for the production of the 10 cars was, let's say, rupees 10 million, which is 1 million per car, while the total benefit, which would be the revenue in this case, or money received from selling the cars, the 10 cars, was rupees 9.5 million, or rupees 0.95 million per car. So this is where we are. Now, the firm has to make a decision about whether it should produce the 11th car or not. Now, the figures that have been given to the firm by the production department are that it will cost rupees 0.8 million to produce the 11th car. So this would, in this case, become the marginal cost of producing another car. It is called marginal cost because this is the cost incurred at the margin. It's the incremental cost to all the costs that have been incurred so far. The marketing department then tells the firm that the car can be sold for rupees 0.95 million. 
So you have the marginal cost of 0 0.8 and you have the marginal benefit in this case of 0 0.95. What would the firm's rational choice be? To produce the 11th car or not to produce the 11th car? The answer would be yes, to produce the 11th car. This is how economists think. However, think of someone who looks at total cost and not marginal costs or benefits. So in this case, after the 11th car has been produced, the total cost of production of the 11 cars would be the 10 million for the first 10 cars plus the 0 0.8 million for the 11th car, which brings the total cost to 10.8 million rupees. On the profit on the revenue side, you have the total revenue of the 11 cars equal to 9.5 million for the first 10 cars plus the 0 0.95 million for the 11th car, bringing the total revenue to 10.45 million. So as you can see, from a total cost or total benefit analysis point of view, the total cost is greater than total benefit and hence the decision to produce the 11th car is not warranted. So if a person were to make a decision based on total cost and benefits, he would not produce the 11th car. But a firm which considers itself an economist will base his or her decision on marginal costs and benefits and will produce the 11th car as dictated by the principles of economics. He will consider the costs incurred in producing the 10 cars as sunk cost, as history which is irrelevant to the decision regarding the future and he will not let it affect the choices he makes regarding the 11th car. So my dear friends, how are we doing up till now? Is it getting tiring and uh, hectic or is it getting more enjoyable and exciting? Well I hope the enjoyment is greater than the fatigue. Let me say something that will reassure you. That is that all that I have taught you so far in the last lecture and, and in this lecture follows from simple common sense. There is nothing in economics which goes against common sense. Simple common sense, nothing more, nothing less. So if at any time you do not understand a particular concept or are struggling with, with grasping an idea in economics, then just appeal to your common sense and your common sense will give you the right answer. So, after that brief dose of relaxation and reassurance, Let's now stab into what is perhaps the most important part of today's lecture and also the final part. And this is the graphical illustration of production possibilities in an economy. The PPF or production possibilities frontier as it is called is one of the most powerful ways to illustrate concepts that we've talked about today. The concepts of choice, and the concept of opportunity cost. Now here is how we will proceed. In the first instance, we'll see how a PPF is drawn. We'll look at what its shape is, what its location is. And in the next step, we'll see how this shape and location can help in illustrating concepts such as choices and opportunity cost. And also, how the shape and the movement of the PPF over time can illustrate the distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Remember, I said that I would bring out this distinction in today's lecture, and I still haven't forgotten that. So this is how we will proceed. Let's start by looking at how a PPF is drawn. A production possibility frontier shows the maximum amount of alternative combinations of goods and services that a society can produce at a given time when there is full utilization of economic resources and technology. As you can see, the table presents alternative combinations of rice and cotton output for a hypothetical economy which produces and consumes only these two goods. Now in choosing what to produce, decision makers have a choice of producing, for example, alternative C, which is 2 million bags of rice and 7 million bales of cotton, or any other alternative, A, B, D, E. This production possibility schedule can be graphically illustrated in the diagram as shown next to the table. The curve, which is called the PPF, and is labeled as such, is the production possibilities frontier. Point C on the PPF 
represents a position of full employment of the econo economy's resources. And remember that these resources are land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. And also represents full use of its technology. Point D is another possible alternative, one in which more rice and less cotton is being produced. The production possibility frontier depicts not only limited productive cap capability and therefore the problem of scarcity, but also the concept of opportunity cost. When an economy is on the production possibility curve, such as at point C, rice production can be increased only by decreasing cotton output. Thus, in moving from alternative C, where you're producing 2 million bags of rice, and 7 million bales of cotton to alternative D, where you're producing 3 million bags of rice and 4 million bales of cotton, you see that 3 million fewer bales of cotton are produced in order to increase rice production by 1 million bags. The opportunity cost of the additional 1 million bags of rice production is therefore 3 million bales of cotton. The downward sloping nature of the curve of the PPF captures this principle of opportunity cost. Now the fact that the PPF is bowed out, sort of bulges out, and is not a straight line sloping downwards, this bowing out captures the principle of increasing opportunity costs. Let's see what this principle says. We first note that economic resources are not equally efficient or productive in the production of alternative goods. So, for example, rice production could, in a hypothetical situation, use capital or machinery less efficiently than cotton production uses capital or machinery. By contrast, rice production may use labor inputs more efficiently than cotton production. This imperfect substitutability of resources is at the heart of the principle of increasing costs. Thus, when the decision is made to produce more rice and less cotton, the resources located or resources relocated to the production of rice are usually less productive. It therefore follows that as larger and larger amounts of resources are transferred from the production of cotton to the production of rice, increasing bales of cotton are given up for fewer and fewer incremental bags of rice. Quantitatively, this is shown in the last column of the table. In moving from alternative A to alternative B, we find that by reducing cotton production from 10 to 9 units, enough resources are released to produce the first unit or the first million bags of rice. Thus, the cost to produce this first million bags of rice is the 1 million bales of cotton that are given up. Note again here that costs here are represented in terms of units of goods, millions of bales, not as a money cost or a monetary cost. Now coming back to our table and diagram, a movement from B to C shows that we must give up, give up 2 million units or 2 million bales of cotton from 9 to 7 to produce the second unit of rice. Thus the cost of this second unit of rice equals the two units of cotton that are given up. To get the third unit of rice, three units of cotton must be given up, which is a movement from C to D. Finally, the cost of getting the fourth unit of rice is four units of cotton. Thus, as we produce more and more bags of rice, we incur higher and higher costs in terms of bales of cotton, which we forego there is an increasing cost of rice production because we are employing more and more resources in the production of rice which are best suited to cotton production and increasingly less productive when employed in the production of rice. This is the principle of increasing opportunity costs. A final point to note regarding the PPF is that points on the PPF are efficient points within the frontier, sort of inside the curve, are inefficient and points outside the frontier are unattainable. Points C and D on the production possibility frontier are efficient because all available resources are utilized and there is full use of existing technology. 
Positions outside the production possibility frontier are unattainable since the production possibility frontier defines the maximum amount that can be produced at a given time. So there is no possibility of producing outside the PPF. Positions within a production possibility frontier are inefficient because some resources are either unemployed or underemployed. That is either not employed at all or employed at tasks that do not fully utilize the production capability of the resources. Now all the discussion that, we, that we've had about the PPF has happened so far in the context of microeconomics. We've illustrated concepts of choices at the individual level, concepts of opportunity cost and increasing opportunity cost using the production possibilities frontier. So some of you might be wondering where macroeconomics comes into the picture. And as I said earlier, we can use the PPF, the shape and how this, the shape of the, and the location of the PPF moves over time to illustrate how macroeconomic ideas and issues come in. So let's illustrate that using a slide. As I noted a few moments ago, that points such as I, which are inside the PPF, are inefficient because resources are either not fully employed or are underemployed and that it is possible to move to points like D or C on the PPF which represent efficient points. Points such as I are a real possibility in the real world. There is no guarantee indeed that resources will be fully employed in an economy or that they will be used in the most efficient way possible. What we are saying here is that the economy is producing less of both goods than it could possibly produce. This is a possibility. Either because some resources are not being used, for example, workers may be unemployed, which would be the problem of unemployment, or because it is not using the most efficient methods of production possible, or a combination of the two. By using its resources to the full, however, the nation could move out onto the curve, to a point like D, or C, for example, and it could thus produce more cotton and more rice. Here we are concerned, note, not with the combination of goods produced, which was a microeconomic issue, but with whether the total amount produced is as much as it could possibly be, which is a macroeconomic issue. Next we see that over time the production possibilities of a nation are likely to increase. Investment in new plant and machinery will increase the stock of capital. New raw materials may be discovered. Technological advances are likely to take place. Through education and training, labor is likely to become more productive. This growth in potential output is illustrated by an outward shift in the production possibility curve. This will then allow actual output to increase, for example, from point I to point U which was previously unattainable, or from point D or C to point U. This illustrates how the PPF can be used to explain concepts like economic growth and in the earlier example, concepts such as unemployment. So my dear friends, we've seen how the production possibilities frontier can be used very powerfully to illustrate concepts like choice, opportunity cost, and increasing opportunity cost uh, in microeconomics and concepts of growth and unemployment in macroeconomics. Now growth and unemployment are not the only macroeconomic uh, issues that, that we need to address. There are issues like balance of payments problems and inflation which are also equally important and we will obviously come to these once we approach the macroeconomics module formally. But for this lecture, let's now try to recap and sum up on what we've been able to glean from today's lecture. Now, if you remember, we started today's lecture by looking at those three fundamental questions that scarcity induces us to think about, which is one, we need to decide what to produce in the economy. We need to decide how we are to produce what we have decided to produce using the factors, the scarce factors of production available to us, land, labor, and capital. And then eventually, who are we to produce for? Who are the people who will be distributed the goods and services and in what proportions? Then we saw, and this follows from the previous lecture, that there are three basic approaches 
to how these three fundamental questions can be solved or can be approached. Those three approaches were dictatorship, planned or command economic systems, or the free market or capitalist economic systems. Now we saw that dictatorships were not tenable in a world which recognizes the benefits of representative democracy. And we also saw that centralized or planned or command economies were very slow to respond to changing circumstances and were also susceptible to corruption. And then we noted that market economies, while they did not pay much attention to concerns of equity or equitable distribution of wealth, were quite efficient because of their use of the price mechanism in determining the production, the production or the allocation of resources in the economy and the production of goods in the economy. And for this reason, we noted the, the market economies have become increasingly popular in today's world. They were not so popular, let's say, maybe 50 years or 60 years earlier, but since the since the fall of the Soviet Union, many countries have recognized the benefits of the market economy. At the heart of the market economy is the price mechanism. Producers get the hint when they charge a price which is too high, and then they immediately lower the price so that they're able to sell their goods. So the price mechanism works very fast, and it ensures that the optimal mix of goods and services obtains at all times to the maximum extent possible. So the price mechanism was one feature of the market economy. But then we noted that there was another aspect of market economies which was equally important and which we focused on for today's lecture. And that was the aspect of choice. Market economies give individuals the freedom to exercise independent choices. So it is not a group of individuals, it's not a set of bureaucrats or central government officials deciding the fate of the entire economy. It's individuals who decide what to consume, what to produce, and what to offer as their economic resources, and what prices to charge for these various things. So at the heart of the problem then becomes, the heart of the problem then becomes, how do individuals make choices? So we've solved one problem, but we've created another. And the deeper problem is in fact how individuals weigh the costs and benefits of different decisions and then sift the decision which gives the maximum possible benefit relative to cost. And this we presented as the principle, the foundation of rational choice making. Now in understanding how individuals make rational choices, we saw that it is not the gross benefit which is derived from a particular activity which is important, but rather the net benefit. So we gave examples of a person who had the choice of either working in Gujranwala or in Lahore. And we noted that while working in Gujranwala will give him a higher gross benefit, it will not give him the higher net benefit because he has to incur higher transportation costs in commuting to and fro from Gujranwala on a daily basis. And therefore, rational decision making in this case would imply that he should choose to work in Lahore, which is closer to his home. Another important point that we illustrated through the other example was that different individuals value costs and benefit differently. So rational choice making or rational decision making is a very subjective matter. What is valued at 2,000 by one person might be valued at 5,000 by another. And we gave the example of costs such as environmental costs. So you had the option of working in a bank versus working, working in, a, in a factory. And, and working in the factory meant that you would be working in an environment where there would be a lot of noise and dis disturbance, whereas working in a bank would be quiet and peaceful. But how much weight a person attaches to this existence of noise, this externality, is, is a very subjective matter. For some people, noise might be a big deterrent, and, and they might not want to, to work in the factory. For other people, it might be not a big factor in, in coming into the consideration, and they might might be comfortable with working in the factory because the marginal benefit of the extra money that they get in, in working in the factory might be very uh, high. Then, if you recall, we went into an elaboration of what costs meant in economics. We saw that economics is concerned with costs which would be costs in a paperless economy as well. And we gave the example of a barter economy where exchange happens without paper money through the, through the exchange of goods. 
And so economists have been puzzled by what really constitute economic costs in reality. And the notion that they put forward was that of opportunity costs. Opportunity costs are defined by economists as the benefit foregone of the next best alternative. And we gave the example of, of the decision to buy a book. Now the purchase of a book, the opportunity cost for this decision would be the benefit of the next best alternative. And we noted that this next best alternative could be different for different people. So for example, we gave the example of a person for whom uh, the next best alternative was giving charity. And we, we said that the person derives eight satisfaction units from giving charity relative to 10 satisfaction units from buying the book. But then there could be another person who derives uh, 15 or 20 satisfaction units from giving charity. In that case, he would make the decision not to buy the book. In fact, he would spend that money giving charity. So that's how we introduced the concept of opportunity cost. Then we want, went on to say that when you come to the decision of selling the, the book, the original cost that you incurred in buying the book becomes irrelevant. And that's how we introduce the concept of sunk costs and the importance of marginal versus total analysis. We gave the example of a firm in which a firm which had produced 10 cars was considering whether to produce the 11th car or not. And we saw that the 11th car, the decision on the 11th car should be based on marginal analysis and not total analysis. This is how economists differ from other people or from ordinary people in thinking about production and consumption decisions. In the final part of the lecture, we illustrated how we could draw a production possibilities frontier and how we could then use that production possibilities frontier to illustrate concepts of choice, opportunity cost, and increasing opportunity cost, which are basically microeconomic concepts. But later on, we also saw, saw how the PPF could be used to illustrate the distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics. In giving the example of the PPF, we took an economy which produced just two goods, rice and cotton. And we described the production possibilities frontier as that set of points at which the economic resources of the economy, land, labor, and capital, were fully employed in the production of those two goods, rice and cotton. Then we moved on and showed how we could illustrate the concept of choice. Choice came in that decision makers could choose to produce different combinations of rice and cotton. So they could, they could devote all the economic resources to the production of rice, or all the economic resources to the production of cotton, or they could choose some combination of the two. More cotton, less rice, more rice, less cotton. That was choice. Then we saw that the PPF can be used to illustrate the concept of opportunity cost. And how was that? We saw that on the PPF, as you move from more rice production to more cotton production, you needed to give up some units of rice to increase the production of cotton. And that indicated the opportunity cost in increasing the production of cotton. So the downward slope of the production possibilities frontier captured the concept of opportunity costs. But the bowed out shape of the production possibilities frontier captured the principle of increasing opportunity costs. And we saw how that came about in a situation where there was imperfect substitutability of resources in the production of goods. So for example, as we devote more and more of labor to the production of cotton, which uses capital more efficiently, then that will reduce the efficiency in the economy. And therefore, more and more units of rice will have to be given up to produce each additional unit of cotton. So this increasing opportunity cost is what explained the bowed out shape of the production possibilities frontier. If in fact resources could be fully substitutable, uh, fully substitutable in the production of, of different goods, then the production possibilities frontier would be a downward sloping straight line. And you will see this in the practice questions that are thrown at you. Finally, we noted that there were three types of points that were possible uh, to analyze in the context of the production possibilities frontier. 
there were points like I, you remember, which represented inefficient points. And those were points inside the production possibilities curve. So they were below the production possibilities frontier. And I said that those points were inefficient because at those points, economic resources were either unemployed or underemployed. And you could move out to points like D or C or some other points on the curve where you could produce more of both cotton and rice. Then we talked about points on the production possibilities curve, which we described as efficient, because you could not increase the production of both rice and both cotton by moving from those points to some other point. You either had to give up the production of cotton or you had to give up the production of rice. Finally, we talked about points like U, which were unattainable and outside the production possibilities frontier. And I said those were unattainable because the production possibilities frontier defines the maximum possible limit which can be produced using the resources, the limited resources that are present in the economy. Using the, this discussion, we also illustrated how the PPF could explain macroeconomic concepts of unemployment and growth. Unemployment could be explained in the context of points such as I. When we said that you were at point I, some of the resources in the economy were unemployed or underemployed. So unemployment of the labor force would, in this case, be when the resource which is underemployed or unemployed is labor. That would explain the problem of unemployment in the economy. When we talk about growth, then we need to talk about points which were originally infeasible. So points such as U, which were outside the production possibilities frontier. And we noted that over time, as an economy grows, its stock of capital increases, its stock of labor force increases, the quality of labor force increases, the, the level of technology uh, improves. And, and so all these factors shift the production possibilities frontier outside. So that at any level, you can now produce more of cotton and more of rice. And so points which were originally infeasible and outside the production possibilities frontier now become feasible and efficient. So using the location and the shape of the production possibilities frontier, we can illustrate both microeconomic concepts and macroeconomic concepts. So that essentially concludes our discussion for today. The key terms and concepts that you should take home from this lecture today are to start with, we started with the problem of scarcity. And then we saw how different economic systems could be used to solve that problem of scarcity. There were three distinct questions that needed to be answered. What to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. Then there were three different approaches. Capitalism, or the free market economy, which used the price mechanism. There was the planned or command economy, which had the central government at the center stage. And we had dictatorship in which there were a set of few individuals determining the fate of the economy. Then we noticed that the market economy has two found founding principles. One of the price mechanism, which is the rationing device, and two of rational choices and the independence it gave to individuals to make independent choices. Then we talked about... Uh, rational choices and how individuals made rational choices. And the key terms to remember there are cost-benefit analysis. Individuals make cost and benefit analysis. We talked about marginal costs. We talked about total costs. We talked about, talked about marginal benefits and total benefits. Then we delved a little bit deeper and said that sunk costs or costs incurred in the past are not factored into economic decisions. Then we moved on to what economic costs did matter for economic decisions. And we introduced the idea of opportunity cost. Then through the concept of the production possibilities frontier, we illustrated the concept of increasing opportunity cost. Finally, we, we showed you points which were inefficient, efficient, and unattainable. So those are three important words there. And showed how those three points can then help explain concepts of growth and unemployment in a macroeconomic context. So that is broadly the terms and concepts that we have covered today. Keep them in your head, and I hope when you come next time, we can start with those strong bases that you've developed in these two lectures. So this, my friends, concludes the lecture for today. In the next lecture, 
we will talk about um, the price mechanism in more detail, and we will start the formal discussion of microeconomics. We'll illustrate the concepts of demand and supply, and we've been talking about those terms, but not quite understanding what they mean. We'll illustrate how consumers make decisions about what to buy and at what price to buy, how the price mechanism comes into play. Then we'll talk about firms, information economics, elasticities, and a number of other interesting ideas. So given what we've covered today, and looking forward to what I've enumerated as the topics to come, have a nice day, go home, look at those practice questions I've, I've put on the web for you, and let's meet in our next lecture, which will be on microeconomics proper. Allah Hafiz. Salaamu Alaikum.